How you doing everyone at home? Is it all keeping it well? Cracking interview for you today with Livingston manager Davy Martindale. Amazing journey that, that Davy's had from being released as a, a footballer when he was younger to kind of various different jobs to, to serve in time in, in prison, which he's very open about, to coming out, obviously studying for a degree and then moving into Livingston as a volunteer coach and then getting the, the manager's job. Really, really inspiring story and I'm, I'm really curious to get your feedback on this one. Um, please let me know what you're thinking and give us a wee subscribe as well. Big thanks as always to Paul at the Green Room for all the production on the podcast. Give me a wee hit up on Instagram if you're looking for any podcast recording to be done. And usual, obviously, thanks to Paul at Let Me Repair for the continued sponsorship. It is a massive support. And we've got another sponsor on today's podcast with Common Youth Clothing. So they are a contemporary terrace clothing brand. They're based in Glasgow. And if you are looking at anything on their site, you can get a 20% discount if you use the code Glasgow Podcast. So give them a wee look. Cheers, guys. Davey, thanks again for your time. Obviously, um, I'm buzzing. I've got you on. I know you're a busy man. Um, Livingston, obviously, taking up. I'd imagine 99% of your time just now. Uh, that's uh, probably about right. Uh, the last 28 days, it's probably been every day we've been in training. So since we came back for the winter break, we've been non-stop. So this is actually the first day off the boys have had because we're in a week-to-week schedule now for the next couple of weeks. So Saturday, mm-hmm. Saturday, opposed to Saturday, Tuesday, Sunday, um, Wednesday, Saturday type thing. Right. So that's into a week-to-week schedule. Do you prefer it that way? Do you prefer kind of constantly on it or? Uh, well, swings and roundabouts, to be honest. If you pick up a bad result on the Saturday and you've got a midweek game, it's a lot better to put mm-hmm. it in bed early doors. You've got a, a, a new game coming up. So I like it that way. But sometimes when you win a game of football and you don't really get time to enjoy the victory mm-hmm. because you're straight in the next day, you're working Sunday, you're doing analysis of the previous game and then analysis of the upcoming game. So you don't really get a chance to enjoy the victory. You don't really get a chance to build momentum because you're just playing game after game after game. Mm-hmm. Without watching your favour when you're winning games, it also works slightly in your favour if you're not winning games because you can put it right at 36, 48 hours later type mm-hmm. thing. You've got another game to look forward to. Where in the week-to-week schedule, you can actually enjoy winning games of football a wee bit better come into your work, you're off the Sunday, you come into work Monday, Tuesday, and mm-hmm. then on uh, Thursday, Friday, you're preparing for the upcoming game. Aye, you've got, there's always something going on, no, I can imagine. Obviously for yourself, I know you you were in the youth system at Motherwell and, and Rangers. Did, was it all, did you always have ambitions of being a football player? Was that when you were at school? Was that always a yeah. hope? Yeah, I think I was quite academic, but I was hopeless at school at the same time. I probably mm-hmm. had the intellect, just never had the discipline. So I was always just playing football. That's all I've ever done. Um, and it probably got me to a certain standing in your local community because of your footballing attributes, your footballing skill set. Um, and I always just played football, but it probably led me to knowing every single person within the West Lowe in the Livingston mm-hmm. area because of like the you were a good football player in your, in your local area. Mm-hmm. So it probably was counterproductive at the same time because I knew a lot of people and probably fell in with a lot of people I probably shouldn't have fell into a bad crowd with at the same time as well, albeit football was my release. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's what kind of stopped you from going the full way with the, with the football? No, 100% me. 100% mm-hmm. my mindset. 100%. I'm sitting saying they'll fall in with the wrong crowd. I was the wrong crowd. I was probably mm-hmm. the one that was the wrong crowd. Um, no, 100% myself. Probably never had the discipline in my life, my guidance in the life. And I was just I was just very, very loyal to the scheme and my friends in the scheme. Mm-hmm. And that was, that was my family, if that makes sense. Aye. When I was Aye. growing up, everybody that I played football with, everybody that I went to school with, and we all hang about the scheme together. And that was ultimately what I seen as being the most important thing in my life. Mm-hmm. And to see the way it, it kind of panned out with not making it, was there any regrets on your part when you look back on it now? Or were you happy the way kind of you decisions no. you made at that time? I just, like even growing up in the scheme, it was probably, you had the ability to be a footballer, but you never ever think, oh, that will happen to me. Mm-hmm. Because it, 
your background, the way you're from. Does that make sense? Like, Aye, hundred percent. Um, so you're you're looking at people on the telly and you're thinking, oh, that's not going to be me. You had aspirations to be a footballer, but I never had the discipline. I never had the discipline to do it right, and I never made the correct sacrifices. I grew up, and it was a gang culture. Mm-hmm. I mean, I was growing up, I don't know what it's like now in the schemes, if I'm honest. I think there's a lot of the community aspects lost from the schemes now, for good or bad, I don't know. But I grew yeah. up in a kind of gang culture, and that's kind of the path that I went down. Mm-hmm. And see then, did you, was there any coaches or anything that spoke to you about it, or were you just kind of headstrong yourself and kind of doing your own thing? No, my dad my dad ran football teams, but my mum and my dad split up, I think, when I was around 15 years old. Mm-hmm. Um, my dad kind of went away from football at that point, and I think that's when I lost a lot of the discipline in my football and ability and my life, probably. Mm-hmm. I became the man of the house. I looked after my mum had two or three jobs, and I looked after my wee brother my wee sister, but I became the man of the house. I probably wasn't ready to be the man of the house, and mm-hmm. um, I lost a lot of that fairly. I don't know how would you say it, advice or um, I lost that in my life. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So it was the that discipline, the sacrifices. I broke my leg because everybody used to chat my door, oh, David, come and play with mm-hmm. I was playing, I was out playing with Rangers, and this was before you could sign S form. So I was out mm-hmm. training with Rangers, and then when you turned 16, you would, you would be a YTS. Mm-hmm. I don't know, you maybe remember back to that, mm-hmm. and it was an S form. So I was training my Rangers, playing with my local teams in the local area, mm-hmm. or the best teams in the local area. And then my pals, a lot of my pals played pub football, amateur Aye. football, on a Sunday morning, I'll come and play, and he's come and play with and you weren't allowed to do that. But me being me, he's went, I know, but it's a game of football. <laughs> and I can remember, just turned 16, maybe even 15, I went to play, play for my pals against that, it was a heavy metal, um, the Dreadnought, it was called in Bathgate. Right. And I snapped, my, I snapped my fibula and my tibia. Challenge, bang, penalty. Um, snapped my fib and my tib. And in the days, it wasn't a, you weren't out for eight weeks. You were out. For, it was a, it was a long term injury. Mm-hmm. And I can always remember Ali McCoy. I think broke his leg playing with Scotland around the same time. Mm-hmm. It was around that time. I think that's when it was. Um, and that was me kind of any aspirations I had of leaving school and at sixteen going into play with Rangers or going into Motherwell. It kind of all fell by the wayside. And I can remember probably never played football at that point for, for about 12 to 18 months. Right, just with the injury, just totally kind of flogged yeah, you. But I had no rehab in my life. I never really had a lot of discipline at that mm-hmm. point. I'd lost football. I think it was probably a six month injury at the time, but obviously me being me and I wasn't involved in football at that point, came out of football, mm-hmm. never rehabbed it properly. Um, and I was involved in the kind of scheme side of things at 16 mm-hmm. year old you find better things to do with your time girls drinking i've never been one to take drugs ironically it's never mm-hmm. been but it's never been something that i've wanted to do or been involved in to be honest but um at that age it was drinking um going to local nightclubs when you were 16 trying to get in going to the underagers all that type of aye, thing aye. Been 16 and 18 where i've probably lost a lot of discipline in my life mm-hmm. And what did you do then? Obviously, the, the, the football stuff had kind of not became an option anymore. What did you do job-wise at that point? I had, I had various jobs, welders, painter and decorator. I was at college. I got my HNC in an engineering discipline. It was an engineering discipline called mechatronics at the time. Mm-hmm. We don't do it now, but you might remember Livingston, Mitsubishi, NEC, Shinitsu, and it was uh, the Silicon Valley, they used to call it. Yep. So I went and done my HNC in that. And then I started working with a computer firm and I was in that computer firm for probably about four or five years. Um, and I had various jobs, but probably more stable for about 24 year old, something along the lines. Mm-hmm. Up to it was around early, late 20s, early 30s. And I got involved in uh, the pub game. Managed to get a lease a bar restaurant mm-hmm. in Edinburgh. And I was working at that for the last the next 45 years. Did you enjoy that, the kind of hospitality side of things? Yeah, I enjoyed it. It was difficult. I leased pubs for Scottish Enterprises. It was mm-hmm. punch taverns at the time, and then I think it went to Scottish and Newcastle. Mm-hmm. I had two or three pubs on the go, but again, ironically, it's probably led me to making bad decisions in my life because I employed a lot of family in the business, 
And um, I had a fire at one of the pubs and we lost something along the lines of 70,000 pounds of damage. And we, all, all we've done for the last next six months was fighting the insurance company, trying to get paid out. Mm-hmm. We never got paid out. And that probably led me to making bad decisions in my life, putting money into various schemes that I probably shouldn't have. Well, not probably, I shouldn't have put money into and get involved in, obviously, um, controlled drugs. Mm-hmm. And do you think that was the the kind of tipping point for you to, to move into that sort of thing? Was it all the issues with the pub? Or do you think there was a kind of point where you just thought, oh, this is, I'm going to do this? It was just a quite way to make money, greed. Right. Greed. Greed, necessity, you could call it a necessity, but was it really as necessity looking back? Probably not, but mm-hmm. it felt like a necessity at the time. It felt mm-hmm. like the only way out at the time. I need to keep the pubs going. I need to keep everybody employed. I had kind of a lot of expectations on my shoulder and you feel that like, well if I can just do that and get some money in and then we get to the tourney next year type thing. Mm-hmm. I did have other options but I didn't feel like I had other options at that time. I'd always been as I said loyalty scheme I'd always kept my friendships with everybody for the scheme and growing up growing up I aspired to be that boy that was probably driving about in a Range Rover mm-hmm. if that makes sense right. like that's what I was the boys in the same position you know I uh, BMW's Range Rovers. I didn't realise there was maybe a more academic way out of life. Go and get a trade, go and get an apprenticeship, go to university. I'd been to college, but never really came to much. I passed it, but I never got a job in that sector. Um, and again, it, it probably all falls down to greed, quick money, mm-hmm. and quick money. And that's what I always say in my life now. I'm never going to let finances dictate my decisions because that's what I probably done at that point in my life. Aye, and see then, did you? I know I should probably appeal like a, a daft question, but when you were in that kind of circle and you're making money and things, do you ever think in that position that this could end with me getting getting the jail? Or do you, does that end yeah. your mind at all? No, no, it does, to be honest. But you always talk, you know, you, the human mind like, is extraordinary. You'll talk yourself into being you're different. Mm-hmm. Seen it a million Aye. times. Seen it a million times. Spent nearly a good part of four years in prison. Spoke mm-hmm. to hundreds and hundreds of people like myself. You think you're clever. You think you're going to be the one that's going to get away with it. So albeit you think about you can go to prison, which you do, but you mm-hmm. talk yourself out of it. Oh, well, I'm I'm a wee bit smarter than this guy. And if I do this and I do that. And I, I wasn't like, I don't mean to downplay it because I don't mean it in that respect, but I wasn't, I was putting money into people buying drugs and getting a return. Mm-hmm. I knew what it was for. It was no as if I didn't know what it was for. I knew what it was for. Mm-hmm. So in one respect, you're going, well, I'm not really, you're talking yourself into you're not really being involved in drugs. You're not selling drugs, Aye. you're not touching drugs, that type of thing. Aye. Looking back, how naive is that? But at the time, it's easy. You're chasing easy money, and that's what I do. Chasing easy money. But looking back in my childhood, probably for about 14 onwards, I was probably on the slippery slope even then. Oh, do you think even going back then, could you see it? Back, you're looking back and was, you, you made decisions in your life like every action has a reaction you mm-hmm. look at that now but did I actually care about that at the time every action has a consequence probably not right. you're involved in gang culture mm-hmm. you're out fighting at weekends you're, you're getting up to no good so no it felt normal at the time but right. that all felt normal to me mm-hmm. that's what we all done you went and you fought with the scheme no, for the other village or the other town, the other mm-hmm. city. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's just what you've done. It felt normal. And do you remember when it all kind of came crashing down? Do you remember when you get caught? Or? <laughs> Aye. I remember that. Oh, listen, I had loads of scrapes with the law before, breaches of peace, assault, child Jesus, stuff like that growing up. But it's very sporadic. It wasn't mm-hmm. if it was something that happened on a consistently basis. But I can remember, and then it was April, April 2004, the early doors must have been five, six in the morning. I know same the doorbell rang. I looked out my the window and it was like unplate uh, unmarked cars with the blue sirens on uh, like CID and it's the Scottish Drug Enforcement Agency at my door. Mm-hmm. April 2004, April weekend, Easter weekend. And I can just it's weird because you're living for that day, but also talking yourself into that day is not going to happen. No. Uh, like, and I can just, like, I don't know if it was a bit of a relief as well when it happened. It's not a relief, obviously, but at that Aye. point in time, it's like, I've been waiting on you. Aye. And did you think you were going to go away for the length of time that you did? Or? 
I knew it because I knew it was going to plead guilty. Like our case was very complex. It was it was what you call circumstantial evidence. I was nothing like I'd never been caught with drugs. I'd never sold drugs, so it was all circumstantial. But I knew for day one that I was guilty, mm-hmm. and I kind of I don't know a weird kind of way. I was always going to be pleading guilty to get us get us out my life. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I'd man. I got arrested in April 2004 and I started university in August 2004. Mm-hmm. I never got in prison till October 2006. So I was on bail for two and a half years. And for the minute my door went that April 2004, I made a conscious effort to change my life. And that's what mm-hmm. I've done. I enrolled in university and I was at university for two and a half years before I got in prison in the October 2006. So was I waiting in that moment, that massive push, that massive nudge, that massive kick in the stomach to change my life? Probably, probably. Right. And that's what it took. And and it's, I it suppose took. studying at uni is hard at the best of times, but if you've got that hanging out of your head at the same time, how did you get through that with the studying and the pressure? Of the... That was the difficult part, but coming into university every day and living a normal life, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. That was my release. I was probably at that point back into my football and taking it quite seriously. I was playing amateur, but I played with Scotland amateurs. I was playing with the best amateur teams in Scotland, getting the Scottish Cup final stuff like that on the Saturday and Sunday. So my football career, albeit it wasn't at a professional level, it was at a decent level and I was doing really well. Um, kind of moved away for the schemes. 2000 and oh, maybe 2000, I moved away for the schemes. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously still kept in contact with a, lo- a lot of people and when you were involved in the public the public house trade at that point as mm-hmm. well you're kind of you're living in the scheme if that makes sense aye. Aye. Uh, and listen let's be honest the hospitality industry there's a lot of drugs involved in the hospitality industry also but again alcohol is a drug it's very similar it's very aye. similar I'm not to it. so 2004 got arrested 2004, the August, went to university, and that was a well, the turning point in my life was the police coming to my door in 24 April. But the point that I changed my life was probably the, the August 2004 when I enrolled at university. Yeah, it was difficult, but it was a nice difficult. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Aye, because you know, I that, suppose it's, it's giving you a focus on it at that time. Uh, there was a purpose. Aye. There was a purpose to my life. I knew where I wanted to go with my life. Mm-hmm. I knew there was a very, very good chance that I was going to go to prison unless something happened with a technicality. But we, I played really, really early in the, the pleadings, like your mm-hmm. court case, played really, really early with that. And um, I just wanted it to be a part of my life that I got over and done with. Right. But I take it must have been hard on the side with like your family and that as well, because that's when it can opens up to that's, everybody, isn't it? That, that's the most difficult part, but it kind of get kept quiet. It wasn't really in the papers. But my name wasn't in the papers April 2004. Right. And I kept it for my son, David. David would have been eight years old at that time. Mm-hmm. And I can just remember in October 2006, we'd obviously had a meeting with the lawyers and I went, look, you're pleading tomorrow. The case is going to go to trial tomorrow. Mm-hmm. So I said, right, well, obviously I'm pleading guilty. The co-accused, right, we're pleading guilty. We're getting this over and done So it wasn't really public for 242 six. And then in October 26, I can just remember sitting my son down in his room saying, look, dad's, dad's going to be away for a wee while. And that explained that. I think David at that point, and maybe he was 10, 10, 11 years old. And that was mm-hmm. probably still, still to this point, thinking about that. It's horrendous that you can Aye. put your kids through that. Horrendous. Aye. And when you, when you were in prison, after, I'd read an article that you'd done before when you were talking about kind of it didn't change you as a person, but you obviously you learned things when you were in there, probably about yourself that you, you maybe wouldn't have at other points. But how, how was the overall experience for your point of view? I try and I'm very positive in life. I try and turn it into a positive. But like it probably opened my eyes up because before, yeah, you're putting money into drugs. I never gave it a thought about victims. Never, like not once did it cross my mind that there's victims, people... Because all you see in the telly was people taking cocaine. Mm-hmm. Hollywood, yeah. like, I'm not being funny, but I grew up with people, I've not really took drugs in my life, but you grew up with people 
that's aspired to take cocaine, go to nightclubs, drive BMWs. It was seen as a, I don't know, a fancy drug for talking. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's the correct terminology. And it wasn't until you went to prison and you realised the impact that had on people's lives. And then obviously people were in prison, people dying, people, people stealing. Mm-hmm. And it was meeting with the social workers, doing various courses and actually meeting um, drug addicts up close and personal that you actually, thank God, like, it's a part of the drug culture that I don't think anybody really, really puts too much emphasis on. They don't think about it. Mm-hmm. The impact you're having on other people's lives. Oh, yeah. I can remember the social worker sitting me in a room one day and she said, you've got flexible moral standards. And it always stuck with me. It always stuck with me. And I, like to this day, it's so true. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like being involved in drugs, I, I talked myself into that being okay because I see it on the telly, you see the Hollywood A-listers right. talking yourself into, ah, it's okay, you're okay. I chose not to think about the impact that had on local communities, the impact that had on drug addicts' families, not just drug addicts, mm-hmm. the extended families. So I had flexible moral standards and kind of that respect. I knew I was breaking the law, but talked myself into it, it's okay because... It's a cool drug, so to speak, Aye. or it was portrayed as a cool drug. Aye. And it wasn't the in prison that your eyes actually opened up and you seen it at first hand, the impact that my decisions had had on other people's lives. I suppose it goes back to what you're saying as well about the when you put the financial thing as a priority, you don't really think about that side of it. But then if you go into prison, you see that side of it at first hand, yeah. and it's probably you kind of describe that to people. I never grew up with a lot. Now, I'm not saying I grew up poor. We never wanted for a lot. We had a good upbringing and the respect. I had a meals and I had a house over my head. Mm-hmm. And I never, we never had a lot. Like, I remember one about the trainers with holes in it, jeans with holes in it, and all our kids have got new trainers. And I was putting bits of cardboard in my trainers oh, yeah. because of the holes in the soles <clears> and stuff like that. So even for that, poverty, poverty changes your mindset, I think. Like people say to me, well, what you've been through, what do you think? It all goes back to poverty for me, poverty in the schemes, because you aspire to have money. Aye. That's the all and end always for me was, how can I get money? How can I get a better life? Well, to get a better life, you need money. How do I get money? Do, do you know what I mean? There was opportunities because you're growing up in the scheme, kind of the gang culture, there's opportunities mm-hmm. to make money that way. And I always think a lot of it comes from poverty. A lot of crime comes from people growing up in poverty. As you say as well, though, it's when you're, you're watching it on the telly and it is glamorised. It's glamorised as an easy option for people to go and make money. It's it glamorised to go and make money, but glamorised for people that are taking it as well. Right. You, you, I don't think you, you, you'll see, you'll relate heroin to somebody being a drug addict mm-hmm. or a dirty drug. Cocaine's just the same, but it's not portrayed like that on the telly. Aye. No, I know it's like a badge honour on it when you're watching it on the telly. A wee bit, aye, a wee bit. But listen, I had pubs, pubs for four years, and how in society, how many people take cocaine and hospitality industry going out mm. and nights out is incredible. Absolutely incredible. And that saying that you said earlier on the actions have consequences, I suppose now. At Livingston, you obviously be dealing with a lot of young guys coming through. Is it just yeah. getting that message into these boys as well? Because they'll have the same attractions that you did at that age yeah. as well. The, the, probably the only difference is they've got a full-time wage coming in. So I've right. got, and I, I probably think they've got a lot more guidance around them. Mm-hmm. There's probably a lot more bad influences as well to that extent, but right. there's a lot more guidance round about you. But I'd probably say... Well, no, it's not an excuse, but I probably never had a lot of guidance. My guidance was my pals in the scheme. Mm-hmm. We were all thinking Aye. very, very similar. Mm-hmm. With the young footballers coming through now, there is a lot of, there's a lot of, I'm not going to say bad people, but there's a lot of temptation in and around them. And it's one of the things that I, I provide at the club. Obviously, you can chat my phone, come and speak to me at any point you want, but we've got a sports psychologist at the club because I think it's an area in life and especially football Whereas young footballers, because our footballers are meant to be role models in society, they've mm-hmm. still got a lot of growing up to do as well. And they're maybe doing that with bigger bank balances and more. So there's a lot of temptation there. And it's something I try to provide at the club is psychology sessions. Like 
they're medical, but they're also sports related. Mm-hmm. And I try and get, we've got a sports psychologist that comes in and we touch on various different aspects of young and old footballers' lives because it's like any walking industry. There's drink, drugs, gambling, and women. Right. And, 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 and again, if you can abuse any four, do you know what I mean? And there's, there's, for me, one of the biggest things in football has been gambling. Yeah. I've seen it. I've seen it ruin footballers' lives. Mm-hmm. I've seen it ruin their lives, and I think that comes from them having a lot of time in their hands and probably having a lot of disposable income. Yeah. And at the football club, like in a normal working day, we try to keep the boys roughly in the club at nine o'clock, and they're probably getting to home at four, five o'clock, half mm-hmm. four, something along the lines. So we try and limit the amount of time they're away from the football club. Mm-hmm. We try and do as much as we can at the football club. Is historically in the football and environment finished at one o'clock, get your lunch and away to the bookies. Aye. And um, you've seen you've seen that now what gambling can do to people with these. I've seen I know players that have lost 20, 30, 40 thousand pound in roulette machines. Aye. I know individuals and listen, I'm not saying it's wealthy footballers. It's mm-hmm. young footballers that are on a good wage for their age, but no more than an electrician, a plumber, and a joiner would be outside. Aye. But they've they've ruined they've ruined their life, or they've lost a lot of money through sitting in bookies for two, three hours a day. Because young footballers go home, and if they're no spending time with other footballers, most of their pals are at work. No, so they've always got time. Or their pals are from the scheme, and they're sitting in the the boozers, or they're sitting in. Um, Ladbrokes or Willie mm-hmm. Hill or something along the line. Mm-hmm. So it is an area we try and touch on and keep as much keep them at the club as long as we can. So we've got a, a bigger influence on them. It's good as well because I think probably more modern day, most boys that age will probably not have that amount of money in in a lot of other jobs that they go into. And it's it's easy enough to say there's a contract away you go, but. A lot of kids don't know how to budget, they don't know what to do with their money, they don't know how to save money. It's, it's massive. It's, it's massive. And even looking at it now, I think just modern society, there's probably not just young footballers, but probably young men, young young girls, they're staying with their mum and dads a lot longer now. Mm-hmm. Like they're probably in their houses till 24, 25, 26, because it's difficult to get in the property ladder. Yeah. And young footballers are very, very similar. I've, like, I'm, I'm not going into certain names, but you've got boys in this football club at £250 a week. I've also mm. got players at probably my top paid players, £1,500 a week. We are not mm. a Rangers, a Celtic, an Aberdeen, a Hibs or a Hearts. You could, like, there's players here that would earn more than it and working in Asda. Yeah. But it's the, the opportunity to become a full-time football player. Mm-hmm. A lot of these players have not got a lot of life skills because they've, are still maybe sitting with their mums and dads or staying with their mums and dads. Mm-hmm. I mean, especially at the lower leagues of football where I've we've been in League One, I've been in the Championship and I've been in the Premier League. Obviously, the more you come up and the higher you go, the more money is involved in the leagues and it probably allows players to go out and get their own house or rent a house. But more and more over the years, I've seen younger footballers struggle, struggle to move out for their mum and dads financially and just... That's the way life is. It's harder to get on the property ladder now. Aye, hundred um, percent. So going back to yourself, when you when you came out of prison, obviously you you did your uni course. Yeah. What, what was your plans at that point? What were you thinking? Kind of because obviously I know you'd said that the kind of penny had dropped for you before you'd went in, but what, yeah. where was your yeah. head at when you came out? Well, I, I obviously I knew I was only roughly six months to eight months away from getting that piece of paper that says I'm worthwhile because mm-hmm. right. that's that's how I seen it. Aye. David Martindale can do this. So there's a bit of paper that says he's worth well. Mm-hmm. Um, and my pal, my pal had moved to London at this point. He had a, a really, really good job. And he was moving back to Perth, but he was building his own house. And when I came out, he's like, listen, do you want to come and project manage my house? It was a big, big house. So I'd done that for around 12 months in between doing my finishing off university. And then finished his house and he had a plot of land and he said, look, I'm going to get funding for a couple of houses. You're interested in project manage that. And so I was just involved in construction, working mm-hmm. for myself. I had my own building company at that point, albeit it was, it was kind of a bespoke developer working for private indiv- individuals. Cradle, um, cradle a uh, grave, so to speak, that was kind of the terminology. So I would go and find the land, 
you'd come in here, I want to build a house, this is what I've got, I'd go and find the land for you, you'd purchase the land and then I'd put a programme together for a fixed fee contract mm-hmm. to go and build a house for you, right. taking away when there's a lot of, there was a lot of wealthy individuals that wanted to build houses, but when you've got a full-time job, you can't, it's a massive job in itself, like overseeing building your own property, you need a project manager, so I kind of, my company was one that I would supply all the trades, I would overlook the build, and you you paid for that process. Mm-hmm. And that's what I was doing up to the day I came into Livingston. And how did the, I'd imagine obviously for, for that point, did you see yourself getting back into football after all that? I was, I was in football at like junior level, so you're looking at the Lowland League now, the East of Scotland League. I think mm-hmm. more people understand the levels of football now, tier five, yeah. tier six, let's call it. Tier one's the Premier League, tier two is the Championship, tier three is League One, tier four is League Five, League Four, and East of Scotland's tier five and Lowland League's tier six. Sorry, I've got a wee bit mixed up. East of Scotland's higher, uh, Lowland League's a wee bit higher than uh, East of Scotland. So mm-hmm. I was playing at a very good level anyway, and I was doing a bit of coaching. Um, so I was back into football. It was at Broxburn Juniors, played for Broxburn, played for Pomfreston, played for Whitburn. Decent junior teams, mm-hmm. and I was the assistant manager at Broxburn Juniors. And an opportunity came up to come into Livingston to do a wee bit of coaching to help me get on the coaching ladder. Um, and eventually, that's kind of what happened. The owner at the club at the time spoke to John McGlynn and said, Look, I've got a young guy who's going to come in, he's going to take a wee bit of advertising through my building company and do a wee bit of work around the stadium. Mm-hmm. And for that, he's looking to come in a Tuesday morning and a Thursday morning. And that's kind of the hybrid role I've done for about 18 months. Club is in a bad way financially. It's going through managers. And mm-hmm. I kind of just worked my way up from there, to be honest. Aye. Until we got relegated to League One for the Championship. And anybody that knows football, there's next to no money at that level of football for mm-hmm. football clubs. Um, and the owners basically came in for one day. So like, ah, look, I'm away. Big bunch of keys. You want to stay, you can stay and run the football club. And that's what I've done. That's what and I've how done. was the... Were you worried about a backlash or anything? Because obviously your past and what it, what it came before? To be honest, there was a couple of wee bits and balls. But see that level? Nobody was really interested. Aye. It was a daily record. They'd phoned up the sun. They'd phoned up, oh, we hear this, we hear that. But it was nothing nothing significant, to be mm. honest. Um, there was a couple of local sponsors. They looked at it, phoned them up. Like, uh, but, uh, listen, we're 20 grand short in the wages this month. And they would... John Ward and that, and Neil Hogarth, they would come in and put a, a couple of pounds into the club to make sure the club could pay its wages. They would get it back in a couple of months, three, four months time. But mm-hmm. that's basically how we ran the club. Ran the club and then we progressed, progressed through League One. We won the league title that year. Then we went into the championship and we got promoted again. So it was back-to-back promotions into the Scottish Premier League. And then suddenly we had all these old owners back <laughs> it had left it in League One. Everybody was back. Everybody was back, and the, the club just kind of snowballed from there. It just kind of took off. Once you're in the Premier League, there's a wee bit of money to put an infrastructure in behind the scenes with the club. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's kind of what happened, to be honest. And here I find myself here today. I got offered to be the manager in the first year in the Premier League, but I didn't want to do it. My daughter had, had, had been married. I was with Martha when I got arrested in 2004, but Georgia wasn't born. Georgia was born in, um, God, it was Georgia, 2012. Mm-hmm. Um, I came out of prison 2010. And me and Martha had stayed together. Mm-hmm. And um, I got off the job and I thought, I don't want to take the job. Like my daughter's starting school. We've got a new life in Edinburgh. Nobody knows my history. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to take it. Um, and that was at that point where hired Kenny Muller, so Kenny came in and Kenny was a high profile name, never really worked out to be honest, um, Kenny was what to keep playing, it wasn't really happening, it was just, it wasn't quite right for Kenny or me to be honest at mm-hmm. that point, and then Kenny left six, eight weeks into the job and it, it all hell broke loose, I was all over every single paper, mm-hmm. it, was, it wasn't a great experience to be honest, I can remember. Like we get the papers delivered. I can remember get running down and trying to get the papers to see if Martha seen it. Mm-hmm. Martha works in the financial industry, and um, oh, I was so worried like she would lose her job. And 
people at Georgia school had seen my story and no, worried about maybe not letting Georgia go to birthday parties. It was it wasn't a great time to be honest. So the reasons mm-hmm. why I never took the job actually happened anyway, but in a negative way, a really right. negative way at that point. Kind of just kept my head down, got on with it. And then two and a half years later, Gary Holt, who was the man who came in to be the manager, left and the club said, Do you want to take a job? And I felt, you know what, it felt right now because mm-hmm. there was no negative publicity that could have came out now. Right. It all came out. It all came out. Obviously, I felt now that I'd been in the Premier League for two and a half years, I could manage the club also. Because mm-hmm. at the point four years ago, four years from now, mm-hmm. I hadn't managed in the Premier League. So it was like, I don't think it was right for me or the club, but it was mostly the negative publicity that I was going to create was a major stumbling block. Aye, because that's what that I was going to ask you. When obviously I remember when when you were there and when Kenny Miller was there and when Kenny Miller left, like you took a lot of flack then as well. There's a lot of kind of stuff about David right. Martin does this, David Martin does that. But how is that for you sitting there in the background uh, going, can help? I can take it right because do you know what? I brought the law and I've got to take it. I'll take it in the chin. Like, I'm not asking everybody to come out and forgive me. Just mm-hmm. give me a chance. Like, People are going to have opinions and go, well, I was a drug dealer. I hold my hands up. I right. was. And you're allowed that. You're allowed that opinion. But it was a negative impact on my family mm. and on your extended family. That was the worst one. I don't, I deserve everything that comes my way, good or bad. But I can mm-hmm. take it on the chin because I've made my bed, I'll lie in it. Mm-hmm. And I've held my hands up and I'll, I'll speak about it openly. But when it's having a proper negative effect on your family, that's when it really, really hurts. Mm-hmm. You can remember like Steve Bruce even coming out there at the end of his Newcastle mm-hmm. regime, the amount of social media, what it done to him and his family, it's mm-hmm. horrendous. It's horrendous. And mm-hmm. at that point in time, a lot of these stories were true. Yeah, Davey Martindale did all do that. That's what I did do. Mm-hmm. But there's only so much that is truth. A lot mm-hmm. of it was truth as well, to be honest, but it's the way they paint that truth. Aye, aye. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was, wasn't it like, oh, David Martindale like, took the club to the Premier League or helped, had played a massive part in taking the club to the Premier League. Mm-hmm. It was about David Martindale being in the Premier League and he was a drug dealer. Like, there, was not, there was no positives. Mm-hmm. And then, obviously, all the SFA stuff came out, what were we looking at, maybe 12 months ago, 18 months ago. And thankfully, the media, and I think social media had a massive part to play in that, the general public on football fans in general. Mm-hmm. And I think they got behind the story and thought, well, give the guy a chance. And Aye. the press jumped on the back of social media. Mm-hmm. And it, it was suddenly really, really negative. The story became a big, big negative. Mm-hmm. Whereas two and a half years previously, it was a massive, um, sorry, a positive. It was a massive Aye. negative thing. And were you worried... With the whole fit and proper test thing, were you worried it wasn't going to go your way? No, I wasn't worried at all because if anything prison teaches you, there's things in your life you can't control. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I was on bail for two and a half years, my life was in limbo. Mm-hmm. My life was in somebody else's hand. It was in a mm-hmm. judge's hands. So you kind of learn to live with, there is certain aspects of your life that you can't control. So mm-hmm. I always, I try not to worry about the parts of my life that I can't control. There's mm-hmm. nothing I can do about that. So I did think we had a legal recourse. If I did get knocked back, it was a lot of, we had a lot of advice for QCs that said, well, if this does happen, mm-hmm. you can go down a judicial review and we believe you'll win that in an appeal court right. opposed to the SFA buildings. So I had that in my back of mind, but again, I'll go back to, I try not to worry too much about situations I can't control or decisions mm-hmm. I can't control. Mm-hmm. And see, during, obviously, all, all that, that stuff that was going on, was there anybody anybody that you go to for advice or anything, or is there anybody you could kind of bounce ideas off? Because I'd imagine when you get the press on your back like that, it's a lonely place sometimes. Oh, I, I can't just come into what whatever's going to happen. I, I never sit down and ask for advice off people. Mm-hmm. I've got a chief executive at the club, John Ward, and I've got a chairman, Robert Wilson. Um, and Robert's been brilliant with me for day one. For the minute I walked in the building, John Ward came in and helped us out in League One. But John John works in the children's panel. He's a successful local businessman. Mm-hmm. So John was always, he was always there, like, don't worry about it. And the directors at the time, to be fair to the directors at the time, they were always 
they were angry at how it had all came out in the press, so they were kind of on my side, mm -hmm. because by that point, they'd all worked with me for three, four years, so they probably understood who I was as a person. Mm -hmm. Like, probably I, I can understand why people look at you in a certain way before. Like, I thought everybody in prison was a drug addict and a bad guy. No. It's, it's, it's unbelievable the amount of, I'm going to say normal people that are in prison. It's mm -hmm. incredible how their lives just change with a split minute decision. No. Something's been wrong in their life or they're just a wee bit down and out in their luck. Do you know what I mean? It's amazing mm -hmm. how your life can go wrong so quickly. And that was a massive eye-opener in life. And I think when I came into Livingston originally, the owners, were, the directors were probably a wee bit dubious of that. But fair play to them at the time. The, one, the, 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 one, the owner of the club at the time was a boy called Neil Rankin. And mm -hmm. he brought me into the football club. And I owe massive, massive respect to Neil for giving me that opportunity. And do you sit now, I know you we were talking about when you were doing your degree there, and you obviously you, you might hold up that bit of paper that says David Martindale yeah. can do this. Do you get that feeling new for being a manager of obviously a premiership team? Do you do you get that same? No, no, it can get taken away for you like that. Aye. Like that's it's, it's actually it's a very cynical industry, mm -hmm. very very cynical industry. It's it's difficult to explain, but I used to say I don't want to be the manager mm -hmm. because I've been offered it once, maybe even twice before. To be fair. Aye. And I'm thinking about when you become the manager, there's only one or two things happen. Well, it's probably only one thing happens. You, you leave the football club, Aye. you're going to get sacked or you'll do well and somebody bigger will come in and pay you a lot more money to do it at their club. Mm -hmm. That's one thing that I never wanted to do. I didn't. I could never see my, my life away from Livingston because what the club's done for my life. Aye. And I never wanted to be the manager. So it's very, very difficult to sit here and think you've succeeded mm -hmm. because of the fear of failure. Mm -hmm. you'll, you live your life and in the media spotlight, don't you? Every single decision that I make as a football manager, not nearly every single decision, is outplayed in the media, whether mm -hmm. it's social media, the tabloids, or the television. Mm -hmm. So for fear of failure, you don't actually get a chance to really enjoy the job, or I don't. Mm -hmm. That's no, what I see. I, I'm, you're, you're pushing to win it. Every, everything's about three points in a Saturday. Mm -hmm. Your life's geared towards three points in a Saturday. Aye. And then as you say, you don't even enjoy it because you're worrying about the next one. You're worrying about the next one, and you're probably six bad results away from your sack. Right, right. It's a, it's not, a, it's, it's not a great industry to be involved in, but I think the adversity I've had previously in my life stands me in good stead for this kind of work. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't really let it worry me too much, if Aye. I'm honest. Right. If chairman comes in tomorrow and says, "Davey, look, your time's up. We're going to get a job." Mm -hmm. I'll go and get a job building houses, I'll go back to project management, I'll go and die clothes, I'll do whatever I've got to do legally that lets me pay my mortgage. Mm -hmm. I've, I've not got any qualms, I don't think I'm anybody I'm not. I've not got any divine right to be a football manager at another club or to be involved in football at another club. But mm -hmm. when that day comes, I've probably got the skill set to go back out into in the industry or the working sector to get another job that I can support my family. Whereas feel a wee bit harsh on maybe let's say a football player that's had a good a good footballing career but he's he's not made money that he can just retire no right. every footballer's made that amount of money to retire um and then they come into football management and suddenly they're out a job in a year to six months but they've no skill set behind them because all they've ever knew right. is being a football player and trying to be a football manager mm -hmm. whereas i think the adversity i've had in my life and the skill set i've had previously it probably i'm I'm set up a lot. I'm a wee bit more fortunate than some others that mm -hmm. I can walk back into society and hopefully get a half decent job. Aye. How do you switch off it? Because as you, you've just said there, like everything, everything you do gets analysed. You've got pundits, phone ins, papers, social media. Everybody's a football manager now. Like you, you know that yourself. I don't read it. I don't. No. I, I, I go on right. I generally like, all I've got is Twitter. Stop mm -hmm. getting newspapers delivered. Don't really watch football and news. Might watch sports scene, but fast forward that. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. Mm -hmm. The pundits are that. Just because you don't want outside influences second guessing what you're thinking. Yeah. Because if you were to read every newspaper article, every social media post, every pundit's post, 
you'd be sitting here on a Friday going, I don't know what I'm going to do here. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Aye. So I try and take all the external noises out of my life. Mm. And I'll be, I'm on Twitter, but I like Twitter for football and news. Mm. But football and news, no concern on Davy Martindale and Livingston Football Club. Mm. I actually go by it. I suppose with Livingston, I like or retweet, but I don't go on looking for Livingston posts. I enjoy getting my daily information, my football facts for Twitter. Mm-hmm. But, um, it's probably a reason why you don't see high-profile managers on social media. Aye. Because I don't think you can switch off yet. There's probably four weeks of the year, and it's the four weeks a year, the six weeks of the year, you're no training. But you're no switched off because you're still doing your recruitment. Aye. But there's less stress because you don't need three points on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. Aye. <laughs> you're building for next year, but... You don't need day three points in a Saturday. Aye. I don't think people understand the impact it has on your family. Like, I go home if I won a game of football, obviously my mood's, my mood's jovial, it's mm-hmm. positive. And my wife and my daughter are, oh, well done, that's great. You go home, you've been beat, or you've maybe lost a couple of games in the trot. It's difficult on your family. Eh? Mm-hmm. And every football manager, it's the same for every single football manager. It's probably the same for every single football player. Yeah. You know that? As a, I don't know, there's a lot of pressure on you to perform, to win. It's a competitive environment, and unfortunately, it's only the winners that get the part in the back. Aye, hundred percent. And see, on the the kind of manager front, I read something that you'd you'd said a while back, and it was about the kind of managers networking because of the route you'd come into the game. You never really had that that network of managers that you could go to. But do you have managers that you speak to or that you can go to at all? No, to be honest, I've probably, I probably have if I chose to do it, but I've never, because I've never done it, I don't do it. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? Aye. I never really, I never really, I've got my coaching staff and I take a lot of advice from the people within this building, mm-hmm. like the coaching staff that have been here previously and the coaching staff that are here just now. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's probably where I'll bounce my ideas off or get my advice from, know anybody external from this building. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I'd imagine there is people I could phone up, but I've never done it and I probably don't intend to do it if I'm honest. I've got to where I am by trusting my own judging, judgment and trusting the people in and around me mm-hmm. at the football club. Mm-hmm. And I think we've got a process at the football club that works and I, I think I'll be sticking to that for the immediate future. But I'm big on making my own decisions mm-hmm. because if I'm going to lose my job, or it's going to be all over social media. I would rather it was my own decisions at that point. And I think by keeping yourself away from all that external noise, mm-hmm. it allows you to make a clearer, more conscious decision. Mm-hmm. Opposed to sitting looking through Twitter, Instagram, and Aye. everybody's opinions on you, reading the papers, everybody's opinion on you, watching the pundits having opinions on you. Like you'd be sitting there, your head would be scrambled. So Aye, I think it's even as that. I find that even as a fan of football, because you'll go on after a game and you'll see 600 opinions and you'll be like, what's happened here? It just goes uh, crazy. Uh, it's, it's mental. It, it's crazy. And you probably go on fighting, well, I thought that in the game. And then you go on and you'll read, I don't know, 100 comments. And I, I never realised that. I never thought about that. And the next Aye. minute, you're starting to think differently. Oh, well, maybe this, maybe that. Maybe that. <laughs> yeah. That's what we love about football, isn't it? Hundred percent football, but I it's a it's a high pressure, cynical environment. If I'm mm-hmm. honest, right. Um, I think you'll make acquaintances in football. Very, very rarely will you meet friends for life mm-hmm. because it's so. I like you've got a plan for the long term, but it's so short term. Right. The one I could go and win five games in the tournament, and I'm the best manager Livingston's ever had. Then I could go on a six-game losing seat and they're the worst manager they've ever had. Aye. Do you know what I mean? It's an ever-changing environment. It's so, so, so quick. And there's no other jobs like that. Like I've spoken about it previously, not just because I'm a manager, but like I've, it would be better having transfer windows for managers as well. At least Aye. it would give you some kind of longevity in the job. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? I think that if I've got a player in a three-year contract there, I can't just sack him and say he's no playing. No. Do that with a manager. Putting on garden leave and tell him to go and sit in the house. 
Yeah, so yeah. many people want to do it. That's the mental oh, thing. It's <laughs> mental. Crazy. I'd be demented. I'd be demented. I'd need to go out work and I'd need to be doing something. <laughs> What's the... Um, we spoke a lot about the kind of pressure side of it. What have the high points been for you so far as living manager? Winning games of football, taking them to a cup final, staving off relegation every year, beating the big boys, like when you can go and pick points up and you're really underdog 90% of the time, to be honest. Mm. Budget-wise, we should be the underdog 100% of the time. Right. So when you, you're coaching all week and the players you've recruited and you can go and pick points up against the old firm, Hearts, Hibs, Aberdeen, and then you're, you're winning games of football. That's, there's nothing better than winning a game of football. Mm-hmm. At 15 minutes in the changing room, I'm a junkie, Aye. a football junkie. I think we all are football players, football manager, anybody involved in the football and industry. At 15 minutes, even fans, at 15 minutes after a game is incredible. And you probably as a fan, you can get and enjoy the full night. And then you're thinking about the next game, but it's a football Aye. manager, maybe even a player. You've got up 15 minutes. As soon as you're sat back down, you go, right, who have we got on Tuesday? Who have we got on Wednesday? <laughs> you, don't get a, you don't really get a chance, but that's the high points for me. There's nothing better than seeing the smiles on the players' faces, the fans, the positivity of the fans when you just go and win a game of football. There's nothing quite like it. Even mm-hmm. walking into the house and my wife and my wee ones there, and dad, oh, brilliant dad. Like, all that for me, Aye. for me. But as a football manager at Livingston, you're going to lose a lot more games of football than you win. Mm-hmm. So I try and take every game in isolation. I mm-hmm. can't control what's just happened. I can only Aye. try and have an influence on the next game. Aye. Albeit, it's easy saying that, don't get too high when you're in, don't get too low when you lose. And that's something I practice and I preach to the players, but... I'm going to admit, for that 15 minutes after a victory, there's nothing better. I was going to say that if you're if you're taking points off like Rangers are saying, like it's 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 hard to maintain that. Don't go too high on it, I would imagine. Uh, well, you could go in next week and I don't know being disrespectful to anybody. You could go and play the 12th team in the league and they could beat you 2 0. Right. You went for beating the, the champions or beating second place or whatever it is, how you want to put it. And then the next week you could be sitting, I could be sitting eighth and Whoever's 12 in the league beats me, and then it all comes crashing down on you. Aye. That's what, that's what I was going to ask you. Obviously, I take it the defeats makes up the kind of low point side of things, then, for the most part. Yeah, yeah, there's defeats. I think as a living manager, you're going into most games as an underdog. You're going into most as an underdog. So we went through a wee bit of this last year when we won 14 games unbeaten, mm-hmm. and we were going into games as the favourites. Right. Team, you lost that game of football. I seen a totally different dressing room because mm-hmm. we were no longer the underdog, we were the favourite, and they then had to deal with being the favourite but right. getting beat. And it was up to me as a manager to help them through that process and understand that process myself. Mm-hmm. Whereas when you're an underdog and you lose a game of football, it's far easier to accept. Right. Do you know what I mean? It, right. It's a far easier process to accept and move on from mm-hmm. with it. You're let's say you're a Celtic Rangers and a Livingston beat you. It's a difficult process at that point. Yeah. To get back yeah. to where you get to. And I think you went through that process for at stage last year. Mm-hmm. We were expected just to win games of football. And, and you never won that game of football. It was up to the easy manager to get the boys lifted for the next game, so to speak. And that's where it goes to that. If you're the favourite and you don't win. The kind of social media side it goes into full meltdown because it's well why have we no one and there's got to be a blame somewhere and I genuinely believe something has to happen with social media. Mm-hmm. I think you need to I don't know I know freedom of speech I get all that but it's something you've got to put your passport up or a driving right. license there's got to be some kind of authentication mm-hmm. because I see the impact it has in players and even when you look at racism and other um issues um mm-hmm. that it creates but I look at it and on a Saturday, you've won the game of football and they'll say, oh, he was brilliant today, he scored. He was absolutely brilliant. The player comes into training Monday morning, he's forgot about that positive comment. Aye. And you lose a game of football, it's, he's absolutely terrible. He's Aye. never a football player. The players read that mm-hmm. and they come in and I can see the overhang in them on a Monday morning mm-hmm. after being slaughtered on social media. I've got to be 
that's where I do look at social media at times and look at who it's affecting and mm-hmm. are they having a go at your player? Because that's what my job to try and lift that player as well or, or put it into perspective for that player. You know what I mean? So many stuff in social media. I, I, social media has got a last part to play in society, but some of the negativity I do, I don't think we're far away from it having a massive negative impact on people's lives. 100%. And it must be hard for, obviously, as a player, but you're a human being, so everything in your body saying you want to just jump in there and bite back. Do you know what I mean? But you can't win. It's... Even for a right sticky spell at the start of the year, and I'd go home, sit on the couch, I wouldn't go on Twitter. I wouldn't mm. go on it. I wouldn't go on it purposely because I didn't want to read anything. Aye. My wife would be sitting there and she'd be, what's up with you? Oh, nothing, nothing. I say, what's mm. up with you? And then she, oh, I, I, I couldn't stop myself. Uh, you need to stop reading it. Aye. Stop reading social media because it's just all geared towards me or the football club. Aye. And it has a negative impact. My daughter's coming up for, you get this right, Georgia's, what age is Georgia's 10 in March. Right. Um, she's on social media. She's not on Twitter and that yet. But she's dabbling with social media. Mm-hmm. It's not going to be long before it potentially is going to have an impact on her life. I don't mm-hmm. think me, me I'm bored about or a player, it's the negative impact it has on the direct and the immediate family in and around football players. And mm-hmm. how, I don't know, sometimes you think, come on, support. There's a clue in the term here, supporters. Aye. Support, support, because we're going to go through times you need where you need the fans to back you. You really need the fans to step up and back you. And we're very, very lucky at Livingston. We've got a small fan base, which we're unlucky that we have, but that small fan base are very, very supportive. Mm-hmm. Very, very supportive. But you know what Scottish football is like? Scottish football is a lot of <laughs> bad publicity via social media, eh? Aye. 100%. 100%. And we touched on it a wee bit then. You're talking about kind of longevity in the job. Do you see your future in football management or do you just take it as year by year and see how it goes? Do you plan I, that I, far ahead? Oh, I have to listen, you put game by game, if I'm honest, mm-hmm. week by week. But I try not put too much emphasis on thinking about the future. Mm-hmm. So where I'm going to be building houses or I'm going to be involved in football, I don't, or I'm going to be at Livingston in the next 10 years or the next 10 weeks. Mm-hmm. I don't really think too far ahead because it's so short term. It's right. all about the next game. So you're so fully immersed in the next game of football. Mm-hmm. It's really, really difficult to have any long term objectives. Because right. you could be wiped straight from under your feet two months later. Right. Would I like to be involved in football? Yeah, I think it's for me, I love it. I love it, albeit I'll probably be a wee bit negative slightly with the cynical side of it. Mm-hmm. But I love being involved in football. It's a passion. It's a hobby that's became my job. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it's not a job if you enjoy it. So if you Aye. enjoy doing something, that, it's not a job. It's not a job. And I enjoy doing this. I enjoy doing this work. I'd love to be involved in football for the next 10, 15, 20 years. But mm-hmm. if I'm not, I'm not. I can't. I've not, I've not got much more control. I can only do my best. I come in my work every day to make Livingston Football Club a better place. Mm-hmm. If I'm making him a better place, I'm hopefully making David Martindale better at the same Aye. time. And if I can do that every day, we'll see where it takes us. Brilliant. Love that. And obviously, a lot of people kind of message the, the podcast that much as yourself, and maybe took a wrong path, made a wrong decision, and they're trying to kind of find a, a way out of it or a kind of better path for themselves. But for, for you being down that road, what, what would you say to people in that position that they're maybe facing down something and they are kind of looking for a way to change? A wee bit of cliche, eh? but today's a day to change your life. But you've got to make that conscious decision. Actions have consequences, but you can also use that as a positive. If I never went, woke up that day, I was sitting in London Road Police Station, I remember at four night, I'm going, I'm going to get myself to university. Because I felt, from my background, I needed a piece of paper to say I was worthwhile. Mm-hmm. I needed a way in. I needed a foot in the door. How did I do that? And I can remember coming out with Glasgow Sheriff Court. I don't think I got out the Monday at about half six at night. Drove home on a Tuesday morning. I woke up and I went on the internet. Looked at courses for Harry Watt University. So I made that first step. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's a lot of times in life you want to change, but if you don't do anything about it, it's never going to change. 
Aye. It's never going to change until you do it. Now, I was fortunate that I'm not going to say I'm intelligent, but I'm not stupid, albeit I've, I've shown <laughs> at times I've been stupid. <laughs> um, I'm quite academic. I can pick things up. So I knew going to university, I would. I always felt I could do that. I could pick up that side of life. Now, I know that's not for everybody. No, everybody's going to have that academic capability. But actions and consequences, go and make sure the actions are positive actions. Mm-hmm. Don't wait till tomorrow to do it. How many times you have I'm going to go on a diet right. on Monday. I'm going to go on a diet on Monday. Just day to day. I'm going to get up smoking next week or at the end of the month. Just day mm-hmm. to day. If you're really, really that focused on it, you'll do it. But discipline, sacrifice, and actually that action, that mm-hmm. first action to go and do it. That's a big one for me. Big one for me. I think I was fortunate, really, really fortunate in prison. I wasn't dead. Usually people involved in drugs, you're a drug addict, or you're going to end up in hospital, or you're in, even worse, you're going to end up in the graveyard. Mm-hmm. I made a massive mistake in my life, but I wasn't in prison fighting different addictions. Aye. As I've been in prison with people that are fighting addictions, I've got nothing outside. I still had a family outside. Mm-hmm. I, I wasn't fighting a physical addiction. You Aye. know what I mean? I came to terms with why I ended up in jail. It was sheer greed, basically, and by mm-hmm. choice. And I knew I wasn't going to make money the main motivator in my life. Right. Probably why I'm still at Livingston, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, actions and consequences in the days of day to change your life. Mm-hmm. No tomorrow, no next week, no next month. Right. Don't make that first step and try and follow through. It was difficult, hardest part of my life, sitting being two and a half years on bail waiting to go to jail. Mm-hmm. But do you know what? As soon as I came out of prison, I kind of... Where my life stopped in October 2006, I picked it back up in January 2010. Right. Picked it back up, picked that back up. And if it wasn't for Harriet Watt University, accepting me back into their course to allow me to finish my degree, I eventually got four years I spent in university and got my honours degree. And if it wasn't for that university allowing me to rehabilitate and change my life, I wouldn't be sitting here today. Mm-hmm. So go out, and, go out and make that positive impact today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Love that. I love that. Right. Before I let you go, I'm gonna I'm gonna fire some wee random questions at you that people have asked me. So you'd be shocked to know they're all football based. Oh, um, good. So the first one is who was your who was your football hero growing up? Probably looking at the football heroes, Gone as I like I'm I'm like Zico, member of the World Cup, Aye. Zico, Maradona. Kenny Dalglish, Davey Cooper, like people like that, like even Graham Sooners to a certain extent at Liverpool. Mm-hmm. Um, all these are the older ones, so to speak. Aye. The older ones, then you look at, like I look at Scottish football, probably, I'm saying recent, but I look at Scottish football when Sooners was your manager and you had Loudrop, Gascoigne, you had Henrik Larson at Celtic, these types mm-hmm. of players, these types of players were all like, why I turned the television on. Do you know what I mean? Right. Why I turned the television on. Sir Alex at Man United, there's a mountain of players you could pick for that team. Mm-hmm. But that was the reason why I turned football on to watch individual players with with these football teams. But there was always Doug Leach and the Scottish contingent at Liverpool, mm-hmm. the Scottish contingent at Man United that made Aye. you watch. I mean, obviously Celtic Rangers. When I'm obviously from Glasgow. I grew up in Glasgow, from Dublin originally. But I also enjoyed watching some fantastic Celtic players over the years and mm-hmm. the likes of Henry Larson. Right, brilliant. This, this one's a thinker, so I would not be surprised here if you've not got an answer on the spot, but somebody had said to me, obviously, if if you weren't the Livingston manager or if you could go back anywhere, is there a team from any era that you'd have liked to manage, like a team you'd watch for outside and be like, I'd, I'd quite like a shot at managing that, that squad of players? <laughs> I think you go back to your mind. I go back to the the one of the, the best teams that's here, surely it's going to be up uh, easy to manage these big teams. Don't give me a half a million, a five hundred million pound budget. But you look at you look at Sir Alex Ferguson and the Man United teams. Mm-hmm. Some of these players he's had, like your Roy Keynes of the day, like Van Nistelrooy, so all these schools, but Giggs, Beckham. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Van Persie's. So it's probably one of the most recently one of the Man United teams. One of the Man United teams that were winning the trebles and winning European Cups. Aye. I had a fantastic, fantastic experience. 
Aye. Brilliant. And if you could go and sign one player for Libby Naru, MD. Oh, there's a few. There's a few. You know who, who I think who I think lit up Scottish football, who I think's been absolutely fantastic. The wee boy Kyogo at Celtic. Aye. I think he's been an unbe- unbelievable, unbelievable player. And I think there's a lot more to come. And then you look at uh, the Rangers teams as well. You look at some of the Rangers players like Ryan Jack. I think Ryan Jack's an unbelievable football player. Aye. I really, really like Ryan really Jack. Underrated footballer. I, I look at Callum McGregor. Like again, you look at Alfredo. Mm. I think he would. I think, do you know what I mean? I think he'd be difficult to manage, but I'd enjoy managing him if that makes sense. Aye, I'd aye. Try to get the best out of him. And but, you get see for players like that when you get the kind of. I don't know if you would term Alfredo a maverick or just a crackpot in general, but do you do you mind players like that? Because I'd imagine some managers are like, no, I don't want to deal with that. Oh no, I'm a magnet to them, to be honest. <laughs> I'm a magnet. I think they all come to Livingston. I don't know. I just I probably see a wee bit of me as well and kind of people with a wee bit of character. Mm-hmm. Like, with a wee bit of character, like I don't know, just a wee bit different. I would love to manage. No, don't get me wrong, I think it'd be quite fiery. But mm-hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> I need me. I need to go to the gym for a couple of months if I go to him in the change room. I think, um, but no, I don't mind that at all. I don't mm-hmm. mind that at all. I love players. We, as long as they're about the the me, we've got that. Like, as a big thing at the club. It's not about the me. It's about the we. Mm-hmm. So as long as collective, the individuals about the collective, I'll manage anybody. Right. As long as they put the team first. I don't like individuals within teams environments. I enjoy individual creativity within the team environment, but when mm-hmm. that individual then becomes about the me and it's not right. about the it's time for them to move on. So I'm quite happy to manage anybody as long as our work ethic was about the we. Right. As long as our work ethic was all about the we, I'd be more than happy. People like Big Duncan Ferguson, I imagine having him in your team. <laughs> I wouldn't be picking a fight with him anyway. Get a half score in a game, big man. Aye. Nine, you would have been modern day footballers. Right. I don't know. I've still to find this coaching manual that tells you how you're meant to play football. I keep seeing this on social media. <laughs> what the right way to play football. Like a Ferrari racing a fiesta, you've got to find a way to win. <laughs> you've got to find a way to win. And that's how I came to say with the players. We're racing Ferraris. We're up against 50 million pound budgets, and your budget's 1.3 million pound. Mm-hmm. You've got to go and find a way. And if I never had the individual characters within my direction, then we would struggle. So I enjoy yeah. that type of personality, if I'm honest. Do you think in the games, when you, like, as you say, if you're playing a, one of the old firm or Hearts or Aberdeen, do you think having that 100% effort and, and having it on the day can make that difference in that 90 minutes, no, no matter who you're playing? Oh, oh, of course it does. Of course it does. But there's, you've then got you know, there is individual ability and individual creativity within teams. So we've got to try and find a way to win a game of football. Mm-hmm. And I laugh at you. Know, I laugh. So I'm talking about not being on social media, but obviously I do read social media. Um, I laugh when they say, "Oh, they just play a low block." See me are playing against a team of Livingston, um, a Rangers, a Celtic, probably them more so than others. You fall into a low block automatically. Nice. They force them into playing in a low block. Mm-hmm. Can I get a hold of the ball? There's international football players on 30, 40, 50 times your salary for mm-hmm. a reason. For nice. a reason. They're very, very good at their job. They're very good at our job. And that's where we've got to tactically come out, come up with ways to try not to lose that game of football. Mm-hmm. No, yeah, so I don't envy you with that, mate. I don't envy you that's with the ones that. I enjoy, to be honest. I enjoy it. It's a, it's a shot to nothing for us because if we get beat, everybody's well. We should have been beat. But when you can go and pick up a draw, go and pick up a win, it feels so much sweeter. Mm-hmm. It feels so much sweeter. But then if you, the shoes and all their foot, and if you tell me, do you want to be a manager of one of the big four clubs and you win 90% of your games, I'll definitely say, I, would def- I wouldn't mind that. Aye. Going home 90% of the time. <laughs> <happy. laughs> Opposed to going home 60-60% of the time sad. <laughs> Suppose as you say, but even if you... I suppose the higher you go, it's just a different type of pressure that intensifies in it. It's just it's you swap but, one for the other. But the chances, the probability of you winning a game of football is higher. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm I don't care what anybody says. You're a far better manager when you're winning games of football than when you're losing. Mm-hmm. Far easier to manage a group of football players when you're winning 
eighty percent give or take to your football games. Aye. We had an unbelievable season last year. And we won twelve games of football in the Premier League. Twelve games of football Aye. we won. And by the way, what a season Livingston had. There's thirty eight games. Aye. There's thirty eight games. I think there was I can't remember how many draws, something like nine draws takes you to twenty five. Do you know what I mean? Nine times nine nine I went home and was like, <laughs> Twelve right. times I went home happy. The rest of the time I went home gutted, gutted that I'd lost the game of football. So if you tell me I could go home if I could manage a team with winning twenty eight games a season, I'd bite your hand off. Aye. It must be, must be <laughs> the environment must be far easier to manage. Aye. it's got to be. You're winning games of football. Hundred percent, hundred percent. Somebody had asked about obviously you did the cup final. How long did they defeats to take to go at the system? Do you can I replay it on your mind? As I was on overhang with the squad, but I'll, mm. I will be brutally honest. I change. I grabbed the boys. We were St Johnson were celebrating. I grabbed the boys. I said, "Forget it. It's done. There's nothing we can do about this." Mm-hmm. And I think that comes from my previous life experiences, the dark places I've been. Mm. Far worse than losing a game of football, by the way. Right. Far worse than losing. I was losing my life. I was losing my family. And I learned to deal with that. So the adversity I had previously in my life allowed me on the park at Hamden to try and get start that process as quick as possible for the players. And mm-hmm. that's what I done. Spoke to him. I can remember Big Marvin was crying because he's like, I'm coming to the end of my career, might be my last chance. That big man, it's done. Right. It's done. We can't do anything about it. We're worried about the league now. We need to get top six. Right. That's our objectives now. There's nothing we can do. Don't dwell in the past. And it probably comes a wee bit of a I've carried my past with me. Aye. There's nothing I can do about my past. Mm-hmm. I can only affect the future. So, in one respect, my life skills for a previous life, for one, a better word, allowed me to start putting that process in my players here really, mm-hmm. really early. But mm-hmm. for me, it was gone. Gone 15, 20, 30 minutes after the whistle, it was gone. Nothing Love I that. could do about it. Love that. Nothing. Uh, Ronaldo or Messi? That's the question I ask everybody that's in the football world. You know what? Right, I'll pick one because I don't want to sit in the fence. <laughs> I think, who would I rather coach, right? Probably Messi. Mm-hmm. Coach. Let me tell him. I'm, I'm asking him what he wants to do. <laughs> <laughs> who would I rather in my changing him? Messi. Why? I think Ronaldo's shown in every league that he can score goals. Mm-hmm. Messi hasn't. Messi's done it at one team, Barcelona. He's went over to France and he struggled, but from a purely coaching point of view, I think I would rather manage Messi and have Messi in my team because I think it'd be easier to manage. And ability-wise, Ronaldo has manufactured himself into the player he is today, but I think Messi's, Messi's had that natural ability all along. Yeah. Ronaldo's had to work, I think, a lot harder than what mm-hmm. Messi has to get to where he's got to. Two of them right. unbelievable, by the way, two of them unbelievable football mm-hmm. players. But if you say to me, pick one or the other, I think I would probably pick Messi. I would go with Messi. You never know in the summer, mate. You never know. I never, I never know. I never know. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. Um, what would David Martindale just now go back and tell his 16-year-old self? Sticking at football, yeah, complete idiot. <laughs> Um, the amount of my dad, but probably not 14, he's probably a wee bit younger than that. But when I look at, I now looking back, I could have, I know, I know being back Eddie, I know I could have played professional football. Mm-hmm. I know I could, I know I could have joined him with the boys here. Right. I know I could, I know if I had sacrificed and had the discipline in my life, I'd have had a, a good career in football, but I never had that sacrifice or discipline in my life. And I was right. loyal. Loyal to the scheme, I'm supposed to loyal to Davy Martindale, if I'm honest. Mm-hmm. I put the scheme before myself. But that's that's what I thought was normal at that point. Right. I know I could have made it. And I think you're looking at, I've seen some, how do you put this? I've seen some <laughs> poor football players. I'm not going to say poor. Maybe that's the, that's the wrong choice of word. Maybe no poor. Players with a lot less ability mm-hmm. make a very, very good living for the game. Right. But do you know what the players had? Sacrifice and discipline. Mm-hmm. Sacrifice and discipline. Ability gets you in the door. Sacrifice, right. discipline, all these other attributes, attitude, application, appetite, that gets you where you need to go to. I never mm-hmm. probably had any of that. I had ability. That was about it. Right. 
Snow on Davey, it. some man, mate. What an interview. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thank Thanks you so much. much. And obviously, best of luck for the rest of the season as well. Right. I hope he's finished. Thank you very much. Nice to speak to you, right? Cheers, Cheers. mate. Cheers. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.